So hello everybody and welcome to this free webinar on computational biology and bioinformatics. Today we have a few speakers who will be sharing their story on how they came to be interested in this domain and how they're using it in their research. We hope that this will help some of you see a path for yourself and ask any questions you might have from the students, researchers, faculty or industry experts and what they could recommend for you. First, we will hear from our research fellow, Sonalika Ray, who will share her project update on liver cancer drug resistance and drug repurposing. She is working on her master's degree in bioinformatics and has joined the research fellowship program to complete this project. Then we will hear from Dr. Laura Harris and her student, Amber Park, they will speak about their stories of how they got interested in computational biology and what opportunities exist in computational biology for teaching, research, and education. After that, our team will share their perspective on how they got involved in bioinformatics. Dr. Mazumdar will speak about bioinformatics tool development as well as how research projects lead to applications in research and industry. Then Dr. Kaur and Clinton Kuna will speak about their background in collaborative projects where bioinformatics methods and big data are a bridge for academia and industry working on cancer. But before we hear from them, let me briefly introduce everybody joining here to Omics Logic. So my name is Deepsha Biswas and I'm the Omics Logic Community Manager responsible for daily interaction with thousands of users who are managed by Pine Biotech and are part of our bioinformatics community. At Pine Biotech, our mission is to simplify bioinformatics for students, clinicians, and biologists. And we do this through our training programs known as Omics Logic. These Omics Logic bioinformatics training programs are running in five different regions with over 10,000 users around the world. Our training is designed to allow participants to apply methods to curated and new data sets and develop independent projects that showcase what has been learned in the context of a personal portfolio of projects. As a result, anyone starting on this journey in bioinformatics can start developing a project of their own. In fact, we have already worked with many students who have completed this kind of training and developed interesting research projects that have won awards and got published in peer-reviewed journals. I would now like to invite Sonalika Ray, who is a master's student from the Punjab University, to share with us more about the project she is working on. So over to you, Sonalika. Thank you, Deepsha. Uh, I'm not getting the permission to share my screen. Okay, thank you so much. Is my screen visible? Yes, so Nalika, we can see your screen. Okay, so a warm greetings, everyone. I'm Sonalika Ray. I'm pursuing master's in bioinformatics from Punjab University, Chandigarh. I'm a research fellow at Pine Biotech and today I would like to share my research progress on my project analysis of hepatocellular carcinoma transcriptomic data for drug repurposing. So before I start with my progress, I would like to share about myself and what made me join Pine Biotech Research Fellowship Program. So as a research scholar, I developed keen interest in omics data science, computer-aided drug designing and pharmacoinformatics. And I wanted to learn more about the omics field and apply data science techniques to it. So I came across this wonderful Pine Biotech course where I could learn each and everything, even in the minutest of the ways. Though I just signed up for one course, but ended up taking more of the courses and was fortunate enough to join the research fellowship program. And now I'm doing my own novel project under the mentorship of Dr. Har uh, Harpreet. So yeah, if you are a research scholar too and looking for good courses, do check out their knowledge back. I especially wanted to mention one more thing. So from last three years, I kept running the program, uh, like I just kept running from the programming languages. It haunted me like anything. But after going through the Omics Logic platform and the program codes for different fields, now I feel confident 
And yes, now I can run my own analysis with R. So first of all, I would like to give a basis of my project to you. So starting with hepatocellular carcinoma, which is also abbreviated as HCC. It is the second leading cause of cancer related mortality globally. It is present in patients with chronic liver inflammation, which is associated with viral infection, alcohol overuse or metabolic syndrome. HCC's uh, significant progress has been made in HCC prevention, diagnosis and treatment in the past. However, more than 50% of all HCC patients have a diagnosis at an advanced stage and 70% of patients relapse within the first five years of initial treatment. Uh, early HCC is often resectable, but advanced HCC often requires sorafinib for systemic treatment in addition to local treatment with ablation, transarterial chemoembolization, or external irradiation. So there have been many drugs which were proposed for sorafinib, uh, like for HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma, but it was just the drug sorafinib, which is uh, approved by FDA in the USA. But there is one problem. Sorafinib at later stages of HCC shows resistance in some of the patients, not some, but many of them who have been taking the, uh, the medicine sorafinib for a longer time of more than six months. So sorafinib is effective in improving the outcomes of HCC patients in the late stage, initiating a period of robust clinical research. So as I told that sorafinib resistance is seen in many of the patients after a few months in the late stages of HCC, let's have a look at what are the mechanisms of sorafinib resistance in HCC. So what is sorafinib? It is basically a multiple target tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It exhibits anti-angiogenesis, uh, anti-proliferation effects and extended total median survival in advanced HCC patients. It suppresses tumor cell proliferation by inhibiting RAF1, BRAF, and kinase activity in the RAS, RAF, MEK, ERK signaling pathways. It is capable of targeting PDGFR beta, VEGFR2, CKET, and other proteins to inhibit tumor angiogenesis. There are drugs like uh, Lenvatinib, Rigorafinib, Cabeso, Zanitib, and Ramucirumab, which have received approval as second-line treatments after sorafenib. Mind me, sorafenib is uh, being used as a first-line treatment, but these drugs have been approved for the second-line treatment. Okay, so immunotherapy for HCC has not yet been approved in China or Germany, and the sorafenib remains a cornerstone treatment in HCC that is supported by robust evidence and clinical experience. However, 30% of the patients, they get benefit from sorafenib and this population usually acquires a drug resistance within six months as already told. So it has been seen that the role of epigenetics, transport processes, regulated cell death and the tumor microenvironment in the initiation and development of sorafenib resistance and HCC. So you see there are a lot of factors which affect the sorafenib resistance. So my plan of action would be to take the cell line, then match the gene expression alteration in resistance uh, HCC with gene expression changes, which are caused by treatment of cancer cells with drugs, which are already approved by FDA for other diseases. Then identify the drug that can reverse the resistance related changes. Then identify the mechanism of action. That is the pathway or the drug target involved of the drug against HCC and provide proof of concept evidence for the validity of the drug repurposing approach with potential use in personalized medicine. So I took different sort of data sets, as I just told that there are a lot, a lot of factors which affect the sorafenib resistance in HCC. So I took four, uh, like eight data sets in total, and these eight data sets had diff different sort of factors, right? So I just highlighted those factors. So there was this mRNA expression comparison, sorafenib resistance related circular RNAs. Then the third data set showed acquired resistance with epigenetic alterations. Something showed transcriptomics. And uh, other data set was related to DNA methylome. Then we had NUPR1, which was a new target, which was found for liver cancer. The IGF, FGF signaling role, SOX9 knock and SOX9 knockdown. So uh, here I've just shown uh, the R out 
outputs for one of my data sets just to give you guys a hint of what actually I'm working out. So this is the data set for the circular RNA sorafenib resistance. Here I had two groups. The first one was sensitive to sorafenib. Another one was resistant to sorafenib. And then I found a regulated gene that was this one. Eight down-regulated genes, and this is the volcano plot which shows uh, the down-regulated genes and the up-regulated genes, and then we have the heat map. Right. So what I did was I took all the all the data set, performed differential uh, gene expression analysis for all of the data sets, collated all the information, and then got all the up-regulated and the down-regulated genes for each and every data set. Right. So this is uh, what my upregulated genes and downregulated genes look like. I copied them all, took it to uh, integrated links uh, web server for connectivity analysis. Integrated links workflows integrate vast omics data resources and a range of analytics and interactive visualization tools into a comprehensive platform for analysis of omics signature and signature-driven drug repositioning. Right, and also I got gene networks from uh, Gene Mania. So Gene Mania is, uh, is a tool itself in iLens, and here I uh, like I can see the interactions of each and every gene which I mentioned in the upregulated and the downregulated uh, gene list. So I am interested in, in the Gene Sox9 because yes, it uh, is very much crucial in the SRHC pathway. So the knockdown of SOX9 was seen to suppress the activity of sorafenib resistance in HCC. So I would want to uh, actually downregulate this particular gene and then try to see the effect on my pathways, whether sorafenib resistance gets away and my HCC samples become sensitive again. And also then we can have a look at whatever genes are interacting with the gene. SOX9 itself. Then I took all the lists of up and down genes to L1000 CDS square and uh, I queried my genes against the reverse effect for sorafenib resistance again. And I got a list of perturbations. And here, one thing which is important is the overlap score. So here I would be getting these overlap scores, which actually refer to the input differential uh, expression genes and the signature differential expressed genes divided by the effective input. So what I'm doing, I'm just scanning all my differentially expressed genes against the, uh, uh, like against the stored differentially expressed genes in the database itself, right? So after doing that, I, I, got, I, like, I got a very beautiful plot where I could visualize the reverse effect of genes. So here in the rows are mentioned my upregulated and the downregulated genes. So this red label refers to the upregulation and this blue label uh, refers to the downregulation. And as I'm looking for the reverse effect, that is if I have the up and downregulated genes, I actually want to reverse their effect using any sort of perturbation, right? So that the uh, expression of that particular gene becomes back to normal. Fine. And in the columns are my perturbations and uh, these red bars as columns with the perturbations as longer actually refer to the score. So these particular perturbations have a good score and these particular perturbations have a low score. So yes, I would be taking into account the perturbations with higher score. I analyzed these perturbations uh, with higher scores um, in, like uh, I end I analyze them using um, PubChem and then drug bank and then try to see if they actually pass or not the important CAD properties. And yes, the uh, so I got three particular hits and here is one hit which I can like, I have mentioned here everything about it. So this particular hit BRD uh, K923171337 shows that it actually passes and satisfies each and every property. And uh, then I could uh, take this particular perturbation to enrichure and uh, look for the gene interactions of this particular molecule with other sort of genes. And here I have the overlap and the target. So target is something like what particular genes this small molecule would target and what expression would it give? Like how would it affect those particular genes? 
So this molecule is going to down, -reg down regulate, for example, uh, uh, FOXA1 and so on. And then I could also check the drug gene interactions of uh, this small molecule in the um, pub chem and then take this particular compound ahead for further analysis. Okay, so uh, one thing more like what I did here was instead of taking everything, all the data sets, results and collating them, I just took up one particular data set and uh, tried to analyze it. And from that particular data set, I got uh, a, a lot of perturbations again. And uh, again, the higher scores were mentioned here. So I took up Gifetane as one of the perturbation and wanted to analyze it further. So Gifetanib failed the Lipinski 3 rule, but yes, passed more of uh, those rules. And uh, then I tried to find out its mechanism of action and the target genes. So that was it. And now I'm looking forward to actually look at how these particular small molecules interact with the genes and how they affect its mechanism and how then those genes would be interacting with other sort of genes and how the pathway would be affected. So uh, hopefully next time when we meet, I would be here with the whole of the conclusion and that's it, passing it on to Beepsa. And yes, if anybody has any sort of feedback, it's most welcome. Thank you, Sonalika, yes. So does anybody have any questions for Sonalika? You can either write your questions down in the chat box or even unmute yourself and ask at this stage. So thank you again, Sonalika, for the wonderful presentation. I, and I really wish you all the best for this project. So Sonalika is part of the research fellowship program. So the research fellowship program has been designed to help young researchers and students take advantage of the bioinformatics resources for analysis of complex high throughput life science data and become versed in bioinformatics. The program offers to you to participate in real and cutting edge bioinformatics research and be part of a renowned bioinformatics community. And here is a link in the chat box. So we have a question at the moment from Gopal. So Sonalika, you can probably share those links in the chat with Gopal. What are the tools used for your study? Thank you, Gopal, for the question. So next, I want to introduce you all to Dr. Laura Harris. Dr. Harris has a long history of working on research with students and is now the director of training at the Michigan State University. We wanted to invite her to share more about her background and allow you to ask any questions you might have about computational biology for those coming from a biology life science background. So over to you, Dr. Harris, thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. So um, my bioinformatics story. This is a different kind of presentation for me because usually I'm used to talking about my research, uh, things about SARS or MRSA or other things regarding antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial therapies. I'm usually not talking about myself. So um, as the uh, introduction stated, I'm the director of training for the Institute of Cyber Enabled Research at Michigan State University. Uh, I've been in that position now for about three months and I'm looking forward to three decades in the future. Um, I'm also the founder and principal investigator of the Harris Interdisciplinary Research Group, which I started back in 2015. Uh, it is primarily a bioinformatic research group, but we have bled over into basic wet bench experiments. Um, and Amber can talk more about that if you have questions. And then I am the elected president for the Michigan branch of the American Society for Microbiology. And I also sit on their Council for Microbial Sciences, where I advise their oh, now worldwide board. Uh, so I've gotten to listen to Dr. Fauci talk and a few other uh, high profile microbial biologists. I thought it would be nice to just give a timeline of my career. 
And I'm highlighting this in particular to show you that a good majority of my experience is in experimental biology, what we typically call the wet bench. I have been everywhere from uh, petri dishes all the way to preclinical dermatology at Pfizer uh, through clinical trials uh, and FDA documentation, new drug applications, investigal, or sorry, investigational drug applications, that sort of thing. Um, and I had a very brief experience with bioinformatics very early in my career, but I really didn't pay attention to it until circumstances later in my career dictated that this was a good approach for me to continue research. And so I'll discuss that in a moment. So where did I start? Well, what you see on the right side is literally my student ID as an undergraduate at Michigan State University. It's a little blurry, but it was issued in May of 1998. So yes, I am dating myself probably the only time in history a woman will actually do that, honestly. My goal at the time was to attend medical school. I wanted to become an MD or a DO. I had two internships at William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. Um, and I had transferred to Michigan State as a junior from a very small Knox College outside of Michigan. Uh, my second semester at Michigan State, I met Dr. Julius Jackson. Now, Dr. Jackson has now retired, uh, and I worked with his wife, who's also now retired, but they were microbiologists, and they were just starting to get into the idea of computational biology and using a computer to help with experiments. So I had him for an undergraduate class. I think it was prokaryote physiology. Um, it was a fun class. And so he recommended I look at this new program that was a combination of a bachelor's and a master's in microbiology. This was going to be my fallback if I did not get into medical school. And well, as you can tell by the initials after my name, I did not get into medical school. Uh, but we started with a traditional experiment research with petri dishes and bacteria and looking at what genes affected what amino acid production. And then we ended up switching to a computational approach, mainly because the focus of my uh, program had changed at that point. So I graduated with my bachelor's and my master's in microbiology. So I already said I didn't get into medical school. So my backup was to go into medical-based research, and I loved it. I spent a few years at Bioport, who is now Emergent Biosolutions, making the United States only anthrax vaccine. So I did research and development for that. Uh, I moved on then to Pfizer, where I did preclinical dermatology compound development, uh, a lot of acne and alopecia medications. Uh, a lot of pigs, because that was our champion. It's got the skin closest to human. Uh, and at that time, I was doing more higher level administration for um, study directors, rather than dealing with the animals directly. But I was allowed to go on the floor, so to speak, and see what was going on. So after having about four years of experimental industry experience, I decided I wanted to become a study director at Pfizer. I wanted to work with my administrator friends. And the only way to do that was to get a terminal degree. So I went back to get a PhD in cell and molecular biology. So I started as a graduate assistant and we were doing inflammatory bowel disease in pediatric mice, looking at bone formation and, and how IBD affected their bone growth. And then I had my first child my second semester in. And so I put this here for many reasons. One, because of Elon Musk's quote, that once you have a family, you're not just taking care of yourself. You take risks for them. And this was a picture taken by my husband at the time because he said this is how he most frequently saw me, asleep. Because if I wasn't working at the lab, I was home studying for qualifying exams and other things. And it took its toll. So I decided about two years in that this was not for me and that I really didn't want to continue doing what I was doing. It took me away from my kids and from my family. And so I said, all right, let's switch gears. And I dropped out of that PhD program with a master's. 
but I wasn't done by a long shot. So then I started teaching. And so I started as an online adjunct teacher because I could stay home and still maintain my role in science because I love science and medicine. So I taught for University of Phoenix for a while, Rasmussen College, who is now a university. Um, and then University of Phoenix invited me to start teaching part-time in person all over Michigan. They promoted me to lead faculty area chair of health and science. And then as things progressed, I eventually became part of Davenport University, who desired, excuse me, decided to hire me in as a full-time instructor. So at Davenport, my primary responsibilities were to teach biology, a lot of it, to mainly to nurses, but once in a while to science students like Amber as they decided to, to pop up on my radar. Uh, and so a lot of teaching, six, seven classes a year, sometimes more. Uh, most of the time it was introduction to biology or human anatomy and physiology, pathophys, microbiology, lecture and lab, um, all sorts of things. But then as I progressed, I got to teach more computational stuff like data analytics and bioinformatics, but I'll get there. I was also a science lab coordinator, so I was responsible for preparing all the campus labs. So for promotion as a faculty member at Davenport, I needed two things. I needed to demonstrate professional responsibility. Now that could be anything from publishing in my field to giving talks like this one, et cetera. I also needed a terminal degree. Great, there's that stupid PhD thing again. So I'm gonna have to go back. And it was lucky for me that quite a few of my colleagues at Davenport were also going back. A few of them were getting their PhD in educational leadership. Others were getting their ED in various administration. But that was because Davenport is a teaching college. It's not a research college like Michigan State is. Michigan State is known worldwide for its research capacity. Davenport's just getting started. I think Amber's what, class number four out of all of our science uh, class, yes, see, she's saying yes. So you get the idea, they're just starting in research. So remember, my overall goal was to attend grad school, I, I gotta get a terminal degree, and become a study director. I didn't wanna teach, I wanted to do. I'm a huge proponent of people learn by example, people learn by doing. So I can't teach science research if I'm not out there doing it, hopefully alongside my students. So I took a whole different approach. I wanted to go for a PhD in a science, but that meant I would have to quit my job and leave my family and basically move back into a lab for five plus years and again, I wasn't willing to do that. So the response was to get a PhD in biomedical informatics. And I was lucky enough to find Rutgers University had an online program that allowed me to do just that. So at the same time, PhD, there's a group of mostly Davenport undergrad nursing students, but then it expanded. It became only the nursing students, but the science students, and now the alumni that still won't leave, even though I love them and, well, they're still here years later. But you get the idea. And we started with one student just repeating that simple project I did back in 2000, and then expanding on that project. And then asking, well, can we apply this to medical stuff? What about antibiotic resistance? Oh, well, there's a spinoff from something of Laura's dissertation, but didn't work. Can we make it work? And one student became two students, became four students, became 15 freaking students. I was going nuts. And we had poster after poster until eventually we had walls of posters. And then we started winning awards by the spades. So here's Amber actually winning one of her first of many different awards. My very first student, Michael Harani, winning one of his. Um, he graduated a few years back. We were honored at all sorts of leadership conventions and uh, you know, excellence in business dinner gala at Davenport, uh, the Chamber of Commerce of Michigan. And I've even been now to national and international conferences where I've got to hung out with or hang out, excuse me, with um, 
Nobel Prize winner, like I'm showing Francis Arnold here next to me from 2019. So it has been a ride that no one ever expected because I wanted to do research. I would not give up on doing research. I had no money for a wet lab, but computers are relatively cheap. So what do I do now? Well, interestingly, I started at Michigan State University up to 20 plus years ago, and now I'm a faculty at Michigan State University. So it's kind of interesting to be literally in the same building I've earned degrees in. Um, I'm the director at training at ICER. And so my job now is really threefold. I teach courses primarily to other researchers, excuse me. I teach graduate students, I teach postdocs, um, and I'm basically teaching Michigan State researchers why a supercomputer is important towards their research and how they can use supercomputing in their research, along with things like basic programming, computational reproducibil reproducibility, excuse me, bioinformatic tools like you saw on the project earlier, et cetera. I'm still doing bioinformatic research. So Amber and I are finishing up some papers on SARS uh, that are somewhat complementary in method to the, what you saw earlier, which was cool. Uh, but we're also, you know, antibiotic resistance. We've got a pseudomonas project. There's a multi-drug resistant E. coli project. Um, there's a strep project. And we've started branching into all areas of microbiology. So microbial induced cancers. Uh, we've seen, well, SARS came up recently and, and kind of unexpectedly for us. Uh, and now I'm getting a broader audience at Michigan State. So things like climate change, how can we model that? How might climate change affect rock weathering patterns? Can we predict that? that? That sort of thing. And of course, public outreach, you know, inspiring people to join bioinformatics or computational anything at this point. Uh, so this is what I do nowadays. So um, if you have any questions, if you're interested in working uh, with my research groups, you know, Amber is uh, gonna be heading off to medical school. She was able to do what I did not, so I will miss her dearly. But anyway, my email address is here. It's ostri at msu.edu. It literally is the same email from 20 years ago. Um, and I'm happy to hear from you. So at this point, I guess I'll turn it over to Amber. And then we'll take uh, questions. Thank uh, you so right much. Before that, uh, right before that, could I ask a question, actually? Uh, oh, you sure. Mentioned, you mentioned that you were exposed to bioinformatics during your, during your undergrad, and mm -hmm. uh, that kind of faded away. So yes. I wonder, what was that first impression that you had? Was it? I'm excited to learn more and use this, or was it, this is something useful, but I don't know where? Like, what was your initial impression? Um, honestly, it was intimidation. So I felt comfortable with Dr. Jackson and the lab, but I did not feel comfortable as a programmer. So I had taught myself basic at that time, and I knew enough to like be able to count nucleotides and amino acid frequencies and, and basic stuff. But then there was a PhD student, Scott Harrison, um, no relation to my last name, but he actually was like a hardcore Linux programmer. And so working alongside him, I kind of felt I was better at the lab part than I was at the computer part. And it wasn't until I got older and really needed the computer for research that I started saying, you know what, that insecurity is in your head. Get out of your own head. And now you're hearing me talk about that all the time about, you know, I still have insecurities that I suck at programming. And my husband will frequently tell me, stop with the self you're actually somewhat good at it. So that was my initial impression. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'll entertain more questions later. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Harris, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm sure that everybody has enjoyed it a lot. And we have Dr. Harris's email in the chat box. I've posted it. So please feel free to reach out to Dr. Harris if you have more questions. And now I want to introduce you all to Amber Park. She's a bachelor's student and she has been working with Dr. Harris 
on research projects that led her to become interested in bioinformatics and even earn awards and opportunities to present her work. So Amber, over to you. Thank you. Hi guys, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Do you want me to present um, a PowerPoint or? Yes, please go ahead. It's up, completely up to you, thank you. So as Laura mentioned, um, I'm a current undergraduate at Davenport University. I'm going to be graduating this semester and going to be attending Lincoln Memorial University in Knoxville, Tennessee. I started with Laura back my freshman year when one of my peers, students, he actually introduced me to what Laura was doing and I thought it was a great opportunity. I never really was a big computer person, but I now I'm taking the actual course and I find it's very interesting because it's a different perspective than most people believe. I'm more of a hands-on person, but it teaches me a lot about what you can learn about biology through different ways. Um, as she's mentioned, I have been at many different conferences for Laura, DU Day of Research, she mentioned, along with MIASM, Van Andel, and even Northwestern. I am still working on the COVID research with Laura, and we are in the moment working on the paper being published and going to start a new one as well. And we are looking to present at World Microbe Forum, hosted by ASM as well. And so a lot of people ask, why and how does bioinformatics in, involved in my life and how has it really changed me? And I, I think it's very different from learning what you do in a classroom to actually applying it. Because with Laura, I saw a lot of different processes with, involving metabolism, um, actual defensive mechanisms, and so on. And you learn things at a very 2D level. And so when you're actually applying it, it the concepts become more real life to me and i think that was very valuable along with just being able to polish my presentation skills for moments like these which i think are very important continuing to build my network and creating general personal relationships because in the future i know that being able to know those people and to be able to interact and build these social skills and presentation skills is very important especially as research is a huge and crucial part in just general the science field so i think that it's great that i was able to be involved with laura and she has taught me a lot and i'm very grateful for her support and her help and always just mentoring me as these past four years so and i think that bioinformatics is very important as we all know that technology is growing at the moment that it's a huge part into how we treat patients and also how we research in general and so just being able to be familiar with these computational programs i just recently kind of got a touch of python not big comm sci person but it's very useful and I think also the publication opportunities, being able to publish an actual paper under my name is very impressive to me and I'm very proud to be able to be part of Laura's work. And as I, as I mentioned before, just having general networking skills and presentation skills and being able to actually apply this knowledge that I learned in the classroom to problem solving situations and learning more. So I think that it's very useful to go out and try different types of research and also to involve yourself in different opportunities because you never know where it's going to take you. And I've learned a lot from Laura and she's given me so many different opportunities to present and disseminate the information and research that we are finding at the moment. So, and that's my talk for today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amber, for sharing your story with us. It was wonderful to have both of you join us today. And again, <clears throat> if you have any questions for Amber or Dr. Harris, please continue to post them in the chat box. And now I want to introduce you all to my team member, Dr. Mohit Masumdar. He is an experienced bioinformatician with multiple publications in peer-reviewed journals and collaborations in industry and academia. Over the past several years, he has been developing collaboration with universities as a mentor and project lead for omics logic training and research programs. So over to you, Dr. Mazumdar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bipcha. Uh, hello, everyone. 
And thank you, Dr. Laura, for that wonderful session. And thank you, Amber and Sonalika, for sharing uh, their presentations. So to everyone joining for the first time, my name is Mohit Mazumdar, and I have completed my PhD in computational biology. Uh, and I've been working with uh, academia and industry to solve important research problems. So in my current role, I'm working with students who are... So as I was telling you that in my current role, I'm working with students who are keen uh, to, you know, in, do research in bioinformatics and are from high schools and are, are undergraduate students from all around the globe, as well as researchers uh, for bioinformatics research uh, interest and their uh, need to complete uh, their own research projects. So, uh, well, I do have other responsibilities as well, but I'm really happy to be an active contributor in this exciting world of discovery. So today uh, in my presentation, uh, I would like to tell you all about my research experience and my bioinformatics experience. So uh, when I started, uh, I guess bioinformatics uh, or having a degree in bioinformatics meant like developing tools or by developing algorithms, which involved a lot of coding. Uh, so certainly uh, the challenges were different than now. So being here for a while, I guess I can talk a little bit about how things have changed or evolved. So starting from the data, the algorithms and the ease of ease of applying those two projects have become like now a matter of you know a uh, matter of getting started so it's a matter of choice now so for my project uh, which you can see on the screen uh, i have an i have had an uh, interesting question in hand which is to be able to functionally annotate sequences using data that has been generated by scientists and then to develop predictive models for unknown sequences. So what I was trying to do was, you know, to kind of develop a machine learning uh, model. So it, the, I thought it was interesting because in this current era of high throughput generation, uh, high NGS sequencing, where there is a large amount of genomic data is generated every day, prediction of gene function and their detailed annotation have become a key aspect of computational genomics. So that's quite evident and I, it has a great importance in the aspect of doing the right annotation. So the focus of the study uh, here was to annotate uh, calcium binding EFN motifs uh, and then classify them based on their binding affinity. So these motifs play a critical role and there are uh, proteins like uh, calmodulin, maybe many of you have heard about that protein. So it plays like a, a major role in a lot of functions. So, uh, so as I was telling you, like how I started and I kind of faced some weird problems so, well, they sound more weird now, but when I joined, I had, a, I have had a data set of just 90 sequences, right? And that was <laughs> exciting because the labs that collectively, you know, sequenced and developed these contra, con, uh, constructs uh, by performing ITC experiments and then by getting the estimation of binding affinity. So, um, they kind of have already spent so much money doing all of that that they were totally expecting me to, you know, kind of develop a predictive model that was like kind of in their part of their proposal uh, for the funding. So what I was trying, what I was trying to tell you is that uh, I was under a lot of pressure and like they were expecting me to do magic, <laughs> but after struggling and trying to apply a um, neural network, uh, nothing worked out and I was getting like very bad sort of numbers for predictions. Uh, prediction of binding affinity, so the accuracy, finding like an accurate numbers for their, uh, for their uh, stuff that they have already, you know, kind of generated from wet lab experiments. So during a lab meeting, uh, I said that even after doing all of this and trying this for six months, I don't think it's possible to predict binding affinity and they have had a, uh, you know, correlation coefficient of 0 0.46, so point, less than 0 0.5. So it was really, really bad. So then I think, my PI, who is like completely awesome, supported uh, my hypothesis is that of that we should collect like all the data from different labs and uh, because like the different labs, they do, do use different machines and over the period of, you know, time, the technology has evolved. So the, the data that has been generated in 1990s might not be as accurate as the data that has been generated like, you know, uh, 2015. 
So there need to be some sort of normalization that needed to be developed to, you know, kind of get these predictions uh, to be uh, in a right, uh, maybe these predictions or maybe the correlation coefficient between the function and the sequence to be, you know, corrected. So after, <laughs> so five years later, we were able to publish this. And uh, let me tell you, uh, like those two years between these five years were just rejections and revisions. And I was really, I really got upset at that time and perhaps like sometimes angry after reading some of the speculations that people have had about this bioinformatics based research. So that was way back, way back and uh, because it's, it was kind of something new and something that was uh, proposed, it was difficult. So uh, after that, I think uh, when, so once uh, it got published, I was kind of determined to prove this hypothesis correct because uh, going through that entire phase. And uh, we kind of ended up doing some experiments uh, by crystallizing the protein structure, uh, by, uh, by doing those mutations that like the server predicted to be like high, high affinity mutations. So we did the mutations by uh, uh, applying side uh, directed mutagenesis. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that, uh, I mean, combining uh, bioinformatics, applying bioinformatics, and then, uh, I mean, validating it using wet lab. So it's a nice combination. And I've seen this uh, being published in a lot of like good research journals, because uh, then you're kind of validating what you have done. And now, like, uh, I see ha the way the science and also the bioinformatics has evolved in the sense that now we have big data. And with big data, the biggest advantage is that, like, we are considering thousands of genes. We are considering the entire pathways. So our hypothesis is much more stronger. And the results that are coming from thousand experiments rather than one experiment is obviously much more conclusive. So as you see in this, in this, uh, in this figure on the right that we, we kind of ended up uh, showing that how the in mechanism in the structure, this actually affects and changes things. So we kind of showed them that, uh, that these uh, entire residues up after mutation, uh, they show a different pattern than the wild type where the structure and the communication between the residues have changed due to some mutations in one site but it has also changed in the other side. So we kind of ended up making this hypothesis that both communicate each other through, this, uh, through these residues. And we kind of did some PCAs and some, uh, you know, uh, computational biology stuff over the results of uh, the, uh, the wet lab results to make it like a complete story and with a lot of uh, insights. So uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that, that uh, going through this entire phase, entire period, uh, I do realize that uh, what challenges students face, what challenges researchers face when they kind of try to compile and uh, kind of want to finish a research or do a good research. So uh, during this phase, uh, what I thought is, uh, have been helpful and has been really amazing is that I've been able to, uh, during this time, I've been able to communicate with a lot of scientists and discuss, uh, talk about my research, discuss about their research and like apply how bioinformatics can help in whether, you know, to design an experiment or to analyze results from an experiment. And that led to a lot of uh, development of skill sets, which, which helped me to, uh, you know, use multidimensional aspects in my own project. So by working in different, different sort of research questions or by looking at different kinds of research questions that what people are working on and what kind of methods they have used, uh, it is kind of helpful to you know, put it in another context of your own question. So literature review and like putting it in context of your own research question is kind of very important. So in that sense that uh, what we have been doing and um, I'm being really honored uh, to be able to part of this team where we are actually directly trying to make bioinformatics much more accessible and uh, going through this entire research journey. So as you know that the biomedical and the healthcare and industry is evolving now rapidly, uh, similar to the space research. So we have had like this COVID situation and now things have different. Now people are more aware and they are more experiments, they are more funding. So, however, I mean, that have been only possible because of the technology that has enabled researchers to, you know, generate uh, volumes of data in much easier and simpler and efficient manner. And, and it's still an ongoing process because it's just happening every day, right? 
So by learning about the system and integrating data, um, understanding the biology, and to interpret this with critical component of this training and this uh, logic, I think uh, we've been able to work on much of like translational research and understand like how a biomarker discovery works, how clinical, uh, in clinical settings, how clinical data is use, useful uh, for therapy selection. So we've been working on research projects that kind of addresses uh, those translational uh, changes, which are like really playing a key role in today's uh, world of discovery. So we are also working with uh, partners and other uh, universities and research students and groups where we have defined like a syllabus uh, which covers all these important aspects of drug discovery and data science into into one uh, one sort of place so uh, where you can start from you know drug discovery to to talk about a disease or to, to talk about a problem you can start thinking about the in the context of data that how data plays a, can play an important role in generating in generating that hypothesis as well as proving that hypothesis correct so uh, I just wanted to show you that this is an upcoming program that we have designed where we are working with uh, several partners and several industry leaders. So it's an industry driven program where we are like kind of uh, uh, created a curriculum which, uh, which is exactly uh, you know, designed with the help of uh, experts who are working with pharma. So this is a pharma driven project where we, will, we are going to go through genomics, transcriptomics, data science, and then the deep of like uh, chemical space. So how, how chemistry is playing a role in this entire drug discovery uh, pipeline. So with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for listening to me. And also uh, if you have had any questions or have any questions, please go ahead and like put them in the chat or you can ask me directly here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohit. And as you are continuing, uh, there was a question from Ramu. So do you think it's, it is hard to do relevant research without an academic position? So this is a very good question, uh, Ramon. So I think uh, what has changed, and as I was telling you that before, if I have to do some real research, I would have to be dependent on a university for a university or a research lab or a company. So because that's where you get an infrastructure and that's where you get like uh, guidance to be able to do this. And the amazing thing that has changed and the amazing thing that we are doing is that like uh, getting you that experience right from like online. So we have like cloud platform where you can do the real research by generating, you know, going through that easy to do pipelines. So maybe Bipsha, you can show them in the later part of this presentation. Uh, but uh, how we are helping them is like, uh, we are using this several tools, uh, several topics and a research methodology so that you can actually do cutting edge research by your own. And if you are motivated enough, if you are interested enough, and if you, if you think that there's a good research question that you can address, then we will be happy to help. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohit, for sharing with us about your experience. Now, I wanted to introduce everybody to a little more of Omics Logic. So the goal of our Omics Logic program is to provide training in bioinformatics, enabling independent research guided by mentors and peer example. And this program is right for high school students to researchers. So we teach everybody, we work with everybody, and we collaborate uh, with our omics logic program and what we try to do is grow a bioinformatics community so it's more about developing a community which has this shared idea of working with bioinformatics understanding what data science is so this is what we do as part of omics logic and we help enable students clinicians and faculty of all backgrounds to develop novel and independent research using latest technology in life and data sciences. So the Omics Logic programs are a comprehensive training programs for students, researchers, and clinicians who are interested in Omics data analysis. So as you see on my screen, here are some of the Omics data types that we offer training on, and we help researchers or even young students complete their research on. 
So the basic programs like these are designed to introduce various types of data, methods, and contexts for omics in cancer, neuroscience, infectious diseases, and agrobiology. After finishing the basic training, many continue to apply what they have learned to an independent project. That is called the research fellowship program, where in part of that program, you can work with mentors who are expert in these fields to get guidance on project design and technical assistance with completing project for a poster thesis or publication. Now I wanted to show you an example. Urja Parekh here was able to complete her project on glioblastoma and have now published a preprint to receive more feedback from the scientific community. Similarly, Dilara Dikin, an undergraduate student at the Bacheshi University in Turkey, has also completed her project on astrobiology and received a certificate of excellence from the Omics Logic Research Program. So as you can see, we have high school students to undergraduate students to PhDs who are working on these research projects and getting started on their own research journey. Now, let me introduce you to the mentors of the program. We have Dr. Harpreet Kaur, who is a certified omics logic trainer and expert bioinformatician. She guides the hands-on sessions and assists our participants with projects and analysis during these omics logic research and training programs. Her area of specialization is in genomics and machine learning. And now I would like to invite Dr. Kaur to share more about her experience with us. So thank you, Dr. Kaur, and over to you. Thank you, Vipsa. Hello everyone, my name is Hatrit Kaur. I have a PhD in bioinformatics focused on liver cancer. Before that, I had done my master's in molecular biology and biochemistry from Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar, India. During my post-graduation, I learned molecular biology and cancer are complex field. And there is enormous genomics data generated every year for thousands of the patients across the globe. So bioinformatics can offer numerous approaches or techniques to analyze such a big data to drive biological meaning from that data. So after qualifying my CSIR exam, uh, after qualifying my CSIR, that is uh, Union Research Fellowship National Exam in India, I joined Dr. GPS Ragwas group at CSIR Institute of Microbial Technology. And Dr. Raghav is one of the key bioinformatics scientists in India. I feel lucky enough he took me as his uh, PhD student He's not just a dream mentor for any PhD student. He's also a great scientist and amazing human being with a lot of patience. To deal every student so patiently. So the sporting ambience of my PhD lab made it quite easy for me to turn my molecular biology knowledge into the bioinformatics research project. My PhD research was on biomarker discovery for diagnosis and prognosis of the liver cancer using bioinformatics techniques. So including my mentors, my PhD boss, and apart from my seniors helped me a lot to learn bioinformatics, particularly how you can apply all the techniques on the data and how you can actually learn programming, which is very simplest. Especially if you are coming from bat uh, wet lab background, people thought programming is like very difficult thing. But my lab mates actually and my mentor uh, teach me that bioinformatics is the simplest thing. If you are just interested to learn about it. Now let me give you some glimpse how bioinformatics can be helpful in identifying signatures or a biomarker for a specific disease condition. Here I'm taking an example from my own PhD research work. So what inspired me to study liver cancer for my doctor research is this high mortality rate of this malignancy and lack of precise biomarker that can help diagnose liver cancer at an early stage. Worldwide, it is considered as sixth major cancer in terms of incidence and fourth in terms of mortality. 
Next, I went through the literature to understand what are major challenges in the liver cancer. So here, when I going through the literature, so I have done my first project. That is, I have developed a comprehensive resource, which is cancer liver. It maintains 115 gene expression data for nearly 9,600 samples of the liver cancer. Along with, there is comprehensive information regarding already existing uh, 600 putative biomarkers for the same that are available in the literature. So in the second project, we used large scale transcriptomics data to identify diag diagnostic biomarker panel for hepatocellular carcinoma. In this study, as I have already compiled the data in my first project, so I have taken the, that data and I, uh, we have employed 30 data set which containing nearly 4,000 samples to elucidate transcriptomics biomarker panel for the diagnosis and the prognosis of the liver cancer, implementing various statistical and bioinformatics techniques. In the next project, we use transcriptomics and methylation data to identify biomarker panel for the stage classification of liver cancer. As it was reported in the literature, if cancer is diagnosed at an early stage, then there are the survival rate of the patient is quite high because their number of the therapeutic options are available. So here we employ TCCA data of 350 samples and elucidate 51 features that include 30 RNA transcripts, 21 methylation CPG sites using a number of the data mining approaches. Here, the particularly the NAPACE model is the top performer that able to classify early and the late stage sample with nearly 79% accuracy. In the next project, we used transcriptomics data to scrutinize the diagnostic biomarker panel for the cholangiocarcinoma, which is another major liver malignancy. In this particular study, we used nine data set containing 350 cholangiocarcinoma, 130 adjacent non-tumorous, 90 SCC sample to scrutinize cholangiocarcinoma specific transcriptomic signatures, employing various bioinformatics techniques, like we have applied various machine learning uh, methods like extra tree, random forest, logistic regression, etc. So eventually, in a conclusion, overall in this study, in the first part, we have focused on classifying SCC from the normal sample and identify three gene-based biomarkers. Similarly, in the second part, we have identified CCS-specific signature, which include LAMC2, ITZ, and CC. And uh, in the third study, we have tried to classify early in the late stage sample, and we have identified 51 or uh, multiomics features. And at last study, we have also tried to identify signature that can actually significantly stratify high risk and low risk reoccurrence group, and that work is still in communication. So in my, during this journey, it looks like maybe it was very easy. So it was never like that. Uh, my first paper, PhD paper is the, came uh, around my fifth year. But in that one year, I have uh, almost my 12 papers get accepted. So in the, my final year, sometimes for any PhD student, or any uh, researcher. It was very difficult to keep that patient. So during that work, so I have learned that to be a PhD, you need to, you need to very patient, but you should not lose your focus because you need to work on everything and never give up on your own, uh, on your top research. So sometimes your publication not get, got accepted immediately. But if you are working on that, so all your publications are uh, usually got accepted in one day. So that's all. So uh, already currently uh, I am uh, uh, since in the year, uh, since uh, September 20, uh, 2020, I have joined Pine, Bio, Pine Biotech team where I have, uh, I'm mentoring various students. So uh, to conduct different projects, as already Bipsa has shown, there are a number of the research fellows who have completed these, uh, their research projects. 
they are graduate student post graduate as well as phd students so that's all if you have any question so you can reach to me thank you so much dr kaur uh, we look forward to your continued support and helping us out with any questions that we have i have posted dr kaur's email id in the chat it is supported by not bio please feel free to reach out to her with any questions you may have and now i want to invite clinton kuna who is joining us as one of the omics logic bioinformatics trainer he has a master in bioinformatics from the university of guelph and a masters in cellular and molecular medicine from the university of ottawa so clinton over to you thank you diksha so my my name is clinton kuna i completed my bachelor's degree at carnegie mellon university where i discovered my passion for research later on i decided to continue learning more about life sciences and as a result of that i now have two masters degrees one from the university of guelph and one from the university of ottawa since i was interested in translational bioinformatics i did a masters in bioinformatics after completing my masters in molecular medicine therefore i am familiar with both biomedical research and data analytics So my specific interest is cancer. Um, so my specific interest is cancer, and it's an extremely heterogeneous disease. We, we are learning more and more about this complex condition with greater molecular definition than before. And to show you how complex cancer is, let me give you an insight of, an, of my past research experience at the University of Ottawa. There are several proteins that play different roles in certain cancers or certain contexts. For example, SLK or C20 like kinase plays an important role in cellular processes such as proliferation, migration, and apoptosis. It affects embryo development and is shown to play a role in tumor genesis. This was studied in new induced mammary tumor mo mouse models. The experiments showed that SLK knockout mice developed tumors faster and showed an increased expression of SOX10, an important biomarker in cancer. However, branching from previously known results on SLK, in my own research, we've, we studied SLK in mouse embryonic fibroblasts, where SLK knockout reduces focal adhesion turnover. It turns out that SLK plays different roles depending on this, the particular context. Even though this contradicts the other study, it shows us how complex the biology of cancer can be and how careful we have to be with experimental design and data analysis to truly understand the pathogenesis of particular um, diseases. Research on SLK is ongoing which is similar to cancer. Every cancer is different, and it's a challenge to determine where those differences exist. We need more advanced methods to determine why a knockout reduces a process in one context, but increases it in another. My master's thesis gave me a glimpse of how bioinformatics can be used to study oncology and um, and the skills I acquired enabled me to use more sophisticated methods of data analysis, such as machine learning, to address the complexity of high throughput data generated from these types of basic cancer experiments. So after doing my first master's in molecular medicine, I realized that I decided to do a second master's in bioinformatics to learn complex data and anal analytic skills. Pure biology is good, but having the data analysis skills to create meaningful relationships definitely solves major problems that can be translated into applications within medicine. Bioinformatics has exposed me to other fields due to its interdisciplinary nature, such as statistics, engineering, and mathematics. My passion for biology, programming, and teaching led me to Pine Biotech 
as an omics logic bioinformatics trainer for the bio uh, pine bios uh, pine biotech's precision oncology program i enjoy going through important pipelines that can be relevant to my learners individual projects i personally believe that i've contributed to my learners research when i answer their questions i enjoy working in the field of cancer therapeutics and i'm grateful to share my passion for the field as a as a master's graduate in both medicine and bioinformatics i truly know the transition from basic research to bioinformatics therefore i hope to make that transition as easy as easy as possible for my learners there are several courses on the omics logic website that that has expanded upon different topic topics within bioinformatics teaching these courses helps me become I'm a better bioinformatician due to the lesson preparation, which involves a great deal of understanding of the course material. Therefore, I look forward to teaching future omics logic alumni. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Clinton, for sharing with us. It was wonderful to hear from your experience as well. And please post any questions if you have for Clinton right in the chat box. And I shall then continue to introduce everybody to the various resources. So today we have heard many examples from our experts and students alike, learning to leverage bioinformatics to advance their careers, pursue research interests and discover new skills that they will continue to use for the future. To continue to interact with all of the people you have heard today and other similar minded students and professionals, we welcome you to join our community. And Dr. Harris had already shared her LinkedIn with you. So please go ahead and find us on LinkedIn. This is the LinkedIn group. So let me quickly get the link for you. Okay, I think. My screen was somewhat frozen here. So I will just quickly go ahead and get that link for you. So this is our LinkedIn group, which I'm posting right in the chat box. Yes, sure, Abdul. So Clinton, if you can kindly post your link in the chat box, your LinkedIn profile, it would be wonderful. You can reach out. And I've also posted again, Dr. Harris's LinkedIn profile. And I will be sharing our Facebook groups as well. Today we also had this session going live on our Facebook channel. So yeah, so let me get back to my presentation. I'm sorry for not sharing my screen. And quickly get you through with some of the resources that I wanted to talk about today. So what I wanted to introduce everybody to is the program resources. So many of you have asked, you know, how do I get started with bioinformatics? So that is exactly what we do at Pine Biotech, help people get started with bioinformatics. So many of our students are coming from different domains, bio, uh, biology, biotechnology, computer science. So to help everybody get started, we have recently launched a portal called Learn Omics Logic. So let us quickly go to the website together. So yeah, okay. So this is the Learn Omics Logic website. If you are there on the website with me, please put number one in the chat box. So Gopal, to answer that question, what type of programming knowledge we need to know for bioinformatics? If you're just getting started, you do not need to know any of the programming languages. And in fact, I'll be taking you through some of the courses where you can easily learn about these programming languages like R and Python. And this portal, the learn.omics logic portal is the way forward where you can easily learn about it. So how do you get started? So in this portal, of course, you have to log in to create an account. Now I will just be showing you how to just do the sign up very quickly. So if you're there with me on learn.omics logic, can you please put down number one in the chat? And if you already have an account, then I know that you I can. Want to, uh, to this, uh, Did I miss any questions from anybody? Please post your questions again in the chat box. So I'm already logged in here. So I will be using my email ID, but you can also log in with any of these social logins. So once I log in, I'm taken to the course page where you will find different courses 
on different topics. So there are some projects that we have designed for you. So these projects are taken from published or publications, peer reviewed publications, and then broken down into different sections from where you can learn about these different steps that these researchers have taken on completing a project like this. So what was the question and what are they trying to do as part of the analysis is what these projects help you with. So these are some of the projects where you can understand from. There are several projects on oncology, on COVID-19, also infectious diseases like Ebola, as well as we have this Python tutorial. So this Python course is somewhere where you can get started if you're somebody who's coming in for the first time and have no idea. There is a course on R and there's a course on Python and you do not need to install either of these softwares into your machine. Those are code blocks which are built into these courses. So please feel free to start with them. But I wanted to introduce you today to the first course which I think every beginner should start with. So we have this course called Introduction to Bioinformatics. Right, so this is the course that I want everybody to get started with. So if you're just coming in and learning about bioinformatics, if you want to learn more about bioinformatics or if you like Clinton want to transition to bioinformatics, then start learning about what are the opportunities in bioinformatics. And again, this platform offers you a free registration. So once you register on the learn.omicslogic portal, you will have a free registration or a free level for the rest of your registration process. And then there would be some lessons which would be requiring a subscription. So that subscription could either be acquired by taking that subscription option, or you can also join one of our Omics Logic program that gives you access to the full learn.omics logic portal. So please go ahead and complete your registration and then you would be able to go ahead and learn from these several courses. So this is one of those courses that we definitely recommend you to go ahead and take a look at and if you continue to explore this page you will note that there are several other courses so you see there's the r course there's a course on metagenomics similarly we have courses on genomics and transcriptomics and also we are working on this course called bites and molecules which is designed for very very beginners especially high school students who are just getting started with learning bioinformatics and biology. So please feel free to look around the platform and learn from this. Now, for those of you who are getting started or wanting to get started with their projects, if you go and click on this research option, it will take you to our research fellowship page. So what do we do as part of this research fellowship program. So now let me explain this to you in a moment. So as you know, the journey to completing an independent research project is long. You will first have to learn about a particular topic, then review databases for specific project data set, acquire the skills to analyze it. In the established educational systems around the world, this process can span years as we have heard from our speakers today, and is highly dependent on your access to the right faculty, resources, and mentors who can guide you in this process. Even when the project is complete, you might need someone to review the outcome and provide you with guidance to improve the research results. Unfortunately, this also means that for many students and graduates, there is a lack of opportunity to develop and complete an independent research project at all. That is why so many are turning to online opportunities where bioinformatics and data science provide an opportunity for a flexible schedule and cutting edge topics to conduct independent research. So we offer this opportunity as part of the research fellowship program. And this program is divided into these six stage processes. So we've already seen one of the projects by research fellows, Sonarika Ray. So this training starts with self-paced training using the big data analysis tools, coding in R and Python, as well as basic courses on statistical analysis, genomic data, and various topics in biomedicine, agriculture, biotechnology, and infectious diseases. In this phase, you will either get on a one-on-one -on -one call with your mentor and assess your interests, current skills, and objectives 
to identify the right courses for you to complete so that you're ready for an independent project as well as meet every week with your group of research fellows who are also working on projects of their own to learn from their projects and exchange ideas as well as collaborate. In the second stage of developing a project, you have to pick up a competitive topic, conduct literature review, find data, prepare metadata for research question, and then plan the full analysis. And this training also happens in group sessions where you will see peer examples, hear from the mentors and experts on how they have tackled these steps and use a guided process to make sure that the plan is executable and successful. Then we ask all of our research fellows to keep a virtual lab journal to track their progress. So leveraging our automated system of learning progress together with a personal journal helps you to monitor your growth and effectively get guidance from your mentor and document your journey just like any researcher would do in any academic lab. Next is performing a systematic or exploratory literature review. Our community of expert mentors have been curating data from thousands of online data repositories to help you get started with minimal time wasted on promising but incomplete project examples. We review publications, develop collections of impactful studies on various topics and design a system of semi-independent projects. Next is developing a research project presentation. After the completion of your analysis, your mentor will help shape up the presentation of your project so that it is concise and effective. So I want to show you some of these examples of our research fellows who have successfully completed their research projects. So I will be sharing the link again in the chat box for you to review. So these are completed presentations of research projects. So once somebody completes either the three months or the six months research fellowship, which is the time that we offer this program for, of course, we can customize it if someone needs to work with us for a longer period of time. But generally what we see is that within the three months or the six months time period, you are able to come up with your own complete research project. So here are some of these examples of research projects done by the research fellows. We have already given the example of Urja who had completed her project. And you can go ahead and watch these videos and learn about what are the approaches that these participants or these students have taken. There are also researchers who have done such projects and how they want to take that research or what are their goals with that research in the future. So once a presentation like this has been completed, we will invite experts in bioinformatics from the Tauber Bioinformatics Research Center to provide expert feedback on the project. Using this project review, you will be able to improve or consider expanding the project for further research. This time, we will help guide you to identify poster presentation opportunities or peer reviewed journals that might be a good fit or target. Finally, our team will compile a full research fellowship report and highlight your achievement on our social media channels. For exceptional projects, we will invite you to further speaking opportunities where you can introduce the project to potential hiring managers or academic PIs. So if you're again interested in joining a program like this, this is the registration to the research fellowship program. And please note that all the details of this program is mentioned here. And again, here we have also broken down the different steps of this process. So you can register by filling out the form here today. And please make sure to select the number of months that you would be interested in, in doing a project like this. So once you have mentioned that you are interested in either a three months or a six months project, we would be reaching out to you and working to identify the research topic that you're interested in. Then you, uh, then you work with your mentor and complete that project. And I also wanted to introduce you to another program that we have coming up. And also Dr. Mohit has already highlighted that program, which is the Omics Logic drug discovery program. So let me take you to the program page first. I saw that, yes, Abdul, there is a cost for the program. So 
If you are interested, if you fill out the form, we'll be sending you all of the details there. And you will also be able to find all the details in the page itself. So I wanted to share again this link. I heard that somebody was having trouble opening this link. But anyways, I wanted to still show you this program. And all the details are mentioned here. So the four sections of the program have been broken down into these four different phases. So as you can see that we are starting on April 26th and this first phase will end on the 18th of May. Next for transcriptomics, we are starting on May 19th and will end on 11th of June. The machine learning phase will start on June 14th and will end on June 12th, July 12th, sorry. And the structural biology or chemoinformatics will start on June 12th and end on July 19th. And post that from 21st July to 18th August, anybody who is interested in developing their own research project related to drug discovery would be able to work during that period of time on with the mentors to develop their own project. So please feel free to go through this. And if you have any questions again, please reach out to us. My email ID is again, marketing at find.bio in case you want to reach out regarding any of these resources and not just this program. And for everybody else, we also have other programs right here. So you can definitely take one of the programs, but then you can write to us regarding this. So if a program, for example, okay, let me uh, first address Abdul's question. So these programs have been designed keeping a syllabus in mind. It's not that each of these sessions, you can come and join any of these sessions. So if you're joining the biomedical drug discovery workshop, you would have to take the entire because they are designed in a sequence which starts right at the beginning and explains to you what are the different things which are required. It introduces you to tools in each of the sessions and all of these programs actually do. So each of these are built, designed in a sequence. We have worked to make sure that even a student who is a beginner but interested in learning about this topic can start and work their way slowly in this four months to learn more about drug discovery so that they also become more confident about what they are learning. They can gain those skills and be introduced to new tools, to new research and work with prominent industry leaders as well as academicians from India who are actually collaborating for this program. So please feel free to go through the syllabus. If you need, we can send you a brochure for the entire program that will list out all of the different dates for this program and what are the different topics which are involved. And for everybody else who are interested, so we also have this site that we keep page rather, which we keep on updating. It's called all of the omics logic programs. So you would have details about the omics logic research fellowship. Then we have an upcoming workshop with AIMS, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. We have a transcriptomics program. So this is RNA seq for infectious disease program, which is starting this week, Friday on April 16. And of course the drug discovery program. So please feel free to reach out to us or fill out the forms in any of these places, pages and let us know if you have any questions. So I wanted to ask Dr. Mohit, would you want to go ahead and share more about the TBIM4 platform or do you want me to share about it? Sure, please, sir. please go ahead. As you're describing this, it will make more sense. Right. So many of you are interested in learning what are the tools that we use to work with these kinds of data. So as Dr. Mohit was talking about, so these days we are talking about 10,000 genes, 20,000 genes. So you need a powerful tool and you need to do it in a place which does not require you to have a very big infrastructure, right? So this is what we offer through the server TBI Info platform. This is included in all of our programs. So in this platform, as you can see, we have several different areas of analysis. So if you hover over one of these, you'll be able to find more about what this means and also follow several different tutorials that are there. So as you see in this section, we have NGS data analysis for transcriptomics, genomics and epigenetics, as well as 
for DNA RNA, which includes the metagenomics or the microbiome data analysis. Then we also have other sections on mass spectroscopy, structural biology, and more, and also a section for virology right here. So using this platform, we not only help researchers work on their own data, but we also train our students. So please feel free again to go ahead and explore the platform. And you can also request access details by clicking out here and be able to fill out this form. So if you're interested, we will be sending you all the details on how to work with this platform as well as the videos which are related to showing how the platform works. So now again the session is open for any questions that you may have so please feel free to share your questions or post them now in the chat box and if there was somebody whose question we had not already addressed then please post those questions in the chat box again so I want to thank everybody for joining this session with us today. We hope that you enjoyed this session. And again, if you need to reach out to us, please feel free to email us with all of the different email IDs or reach out via the forms that we have shared already. And thank you all again for attending today's session. We will be sending you the video recording of this session via email. So please keep a note, it's marketing at pine.bio. And you can also again, continue to reach out to us via the email addresses or the social media groups. And thank you all again for joining. Thank you again, Dr. Harris and Amber for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. We wish you both- Thank you, Bita, and thanks everyone for joining. Okay. Okay, Lewis has a question about the platform. What is similar and what is different between the TBI and from the Omics Logic subscription? So any of the subscription for the programs will give you access to the TBI Info platform. However, if you are looking forward to work on your own data, we also offer a license for researchers, which starts at $99 a month. But for anybody who's starting out, we offer it for three months, which is $297. So if you're interested, to work on your own data sets, we offer the research license for anybody else who are just looking forward to train or be part of one of these Omex Logic programs or take the courses by themselves. We have the educational license, which is included in all of our programs so that you automatically get access once you are joining a program. So this is about, so there's not much of a difference. It's only about the kind of license you're using and the data types. So thank you again for that question. And anybody interested to work on a specific topic, please again, email us. Marketing at pine.bio is the email ID and I'll be able to help you out with reaching out to any resources. And if you again need to reach out to any of our speakers here as well, I can help you with that, with any of the questions that you may have. So thank you all for attending today's webinar. And I wish you all a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Mazumdar. Thank you, Elia. So, Zainab, as I mentioned, that if you're interested in taking a program, it would be we would suggest that you have to take everything in a sequence for one of the portions. So, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Clinton.